All right, welcome to tonight's virtual event featuring La Crema Winery. My name is Shannon and I am a part of the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlet social team. We have a super special event for you tonight as part of our 90 Days Around the World promotion. We've taken you all over the world to various different wineries and distilleries and we've met some of the industry's biggest brand names. Uh, tonight we find ourselves in Sonoma County, California. So I am joined by three experts tonight. We have Craig McAllister. He is La Crema's head winemaker. We also have Marita Esteva, um, the Galactic Wine Ambassador, as well as Lisa Goslin from our New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlet Wines marketing team. Craig and Rita have a super exciting presentation to share with us tonight. And I'm here to share any questions that you may have for them. So please leave those in the comment section. Um, Lisa is going to be here to answer any questions you have regarding inventory or availability in all of our New Hampshire liquor and wine outlets. So be sure to leave some questions for her as well. For those of you that have pre-registered tonight, we will be giving away three La Crema prize packs. Um, we're going to be asking three tri trivia questions throughout the night. So be sure you're listening very closely uh, for your chance to win. Winners are going to be contacted via email tomorrow. So be sure to look for that in your inboxes. And with that, I will pass, pass it off to you, Craig and Marita, to get started. What can you tell us about La Crema Wines? Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Super excited to be here. Thank you so much for letting us be a part of this special celebration and just before the turn of the year. So still a few more days to pack up and get some La Crema, but let's get right down to it. So first of all, we're going to just go over a history of kind of La Crema. We're gonna get into the wines. And of course we have our winemaker here. So Craig will definitely take it away. And then we'll also talk about this really fun and exciting pizza and wine pairing. I hope everyone has a slice of pie and a glass of La Crema and we're ready to go. Okay, awesome. So Craig, let's, uh, let's tell them a little bit about the history of La Crema. When was La, Cre La Crema founded? Sure, and um, before we get to that, just a. Uh, 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 a warm welcome from California and thanks so much for uh, logging on and, and joining us tonight. I've got to say I've enjoyed my last uh, two visits to uh, New Hampshire. Uh, nowhere better to be in the middle of January. Um, and I'm sorry that we can't be there in 2021, but hoping we can get back there in 2022 for the, uh, for the grand tasting there. But anyway, back to La Crema. Uh, La Crema was founded back in 1979. Uh, our original name at that time was La Crema Viniera, uh, which translates to the best of the vine. Uh, and if we go back to 79, you know, La Crema really was one of the pioneers, if you will, of, of cool climate, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir uh, production in this part of California. And that, that key word there, cool climate, is, is very important. And we'll touch on that as we, we go along uh, this afternoon. Um, so 1979, things got away to a really good start. La Crema became one of the darlings of the, uh, of the wine world. Uh, and sadly, you know, sort of fell into a, a bit of uh, disrepair, if you will, uh, but was rescued really uh, in the uh, early 90s by Jess Jackson, um, who really turned it on its head, uh, built this winery where I'm sitting now uh, for the harvest of 1996, and, uh, and really set La Crema back on this pretty stellar rise of, of delivering quality wines year after year from cool climate Appalachians. So what I mean about cool climate uh, and how that works for us is that we're only growing grapes in vineyards or Appalachians that are influenced by the Pacific Ocean. So the, the ocean uh, here is really cold. Uh, you know, don't, don't think about the beautiful beaches of Southern California when you're thinking about, uh, about the Pacific here. It, it's rugged, it's, uh, it's windswept, uh, it's, it's brooding, it's incredibly sharky. It really isn't that attractive of a, uh, of a place to wanna to go swimming. But what it does is it creates the perfect climate for us to, uh, to grow um, cool climate grapes. And in our case, that's Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, predominantly Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So there's a, a little bit of the history. Marita, any, anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, 
And just to, uh, because we will have a quiz question about kind of the overall history of La Crema, since my background is in jazz, um, a few little jazz hand things to note. When we started 1979, so make note of that. Uh, another jazz hand, the original name of La Crema. And the last one that I wanna add, which is kind of a fun quiz, is the name Carl with a K, Carl the Fog. Carl is the reason that we have that cool climate. So um, it is real, uh, you can look him up. He has a huge Instagram following as well as on Facebook. People take pictures of Carl the Fog. He is the reason that there was that famous quote, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. So yes, do not come with shorts. <laughs> you will be buying a lot of sweat shorts. So yeah, definitely. So it's so important to say that because again, what, why do we need that cool climate? Beautiful. So, you know, as we talk about this more, Craig, you know, um, when did you come to La Crema and when did you fall in love with La Crema? Let's give people a little bit of your background in history. Well, thank you. Yeah, you've probably worked out already that uh, I'm not a California native. Um, so I, uh, I'm from New Zealand, uh, was born there and, and studied uh, winemaking there and, and worked quite a few harvests in New Zealand before uh, coming to California in 2007. I was lucky to have been introduced to La Crema a couple of years before that uh, by a friend of mine from New Zealand who had worked uh, at La Crema. And he bought some wines back uh, and we tasted. So that was my introduction to the Russian River, to the Sonoma Coast Appalachian and, and really piqued my interest in, in setting out and doing a bit of wine travel uh, and, and coming to California for, for what I thought was going to be one harvest. Uh, and I'm still here 13 years later. So, uh, so it's really worked out pretty well for me. And, and you know, this is a, an absolutely gorgeous place to be living and working and, and the wine industry is a, a great deal of fun. You know, one of the, the real joys and one of the beauties of this industry is that you can travel uh, and cross the equator and, and sometimes three times a year in search of harvest. And uh, you know, good luck is, is, is part of the equation, um, you know, being in the right place at the right time. But I was very lucky to be offered a, a number of positions in the winemaking team here and, and that culminated in, in being offered the head winemaker position uh, about three, coming on four years ago, sorry. So exciting times. Yeah, it has been. Now, Craig, you said one thing once, one time when we were presenting together uh, and it stuck with me and you said that one of the reasons, you know, you've been with La Crema for 13 years, a lot of people would have been like, okay, that's enough time, pop around and things like that. But what you said to me, and I'd love for you to kind of extrapolate a little bit, if you can, is that what keeps you coming back was that, you know, you haven't made, you haven't discovered all the vineyards yet. And I think that's a story to really be told, you know, we make wine from Oregon all the way down to Santa Barbara. It's made in similar fashions, depending as you could say, but it's really about place. So why don't you tell us about one of the places that you love to make wine out of in Sonoma County? Gosh, it's, it's really like uh, picking your favorite child. Um, you know, <laughs> Marita, you, you really hit the, the nail on the head that, you know, the, I don't think I've had a day in this job where I've woken up and said, oh, I don't want to go to work today. You know, it's always exciting. We're always, we're always searching out something new and, and, and trying to, to make the very best wines that we can. Um, and, and, you know, if we think about the wines that La Crema makes, people might think that it's a handful of, of, of different wines. But if you were to line them up, I think we're currently at about 32 or 33 different wines uh, that we make for the La Crema label. And some of those are only available in, in tasting room uh, or say restaurants, um, as, as well as those that's, that are distributed throughout the, uh, throughout the country, if not the world. But with so many world-class vineyards and appellations to, to work from, I, you know, I keep coming back to the Sonoma Coast, you know, as I was explaining about the Pacific, it's rugged, it's, it, you know, it's pristine uh, dirt that we're, we're farming on and in. And we have one vineyard that I think that's pretty special is uh, right out on the, the California coast in the far northwestern corner of Sonoma County. If you go much further, you're into Mendocino in a tiny little town called Annapolis. 
Uh, and there's really not a great deal there. There's, uh, there's a handful of vineyards. Uh, I think there's a school. I think we've even shut the post office these days, but just a, a gorgeous site. It's about four miles from the ocean. The vineyard itself is ringed by cedars and redwoods. It, it really is a, a, a very special vineyard and, a, and I think a pretty special place on the, on the map. Um, and for us, it, it's super important because uh, when we get to the wines, it plays a, a very big part in our Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir, but also one of our, uh, one of our single vineyard Pinots as well. Beautiful. You know, one of the reasons that I love the Cinema Coast series and expression is that you get some of that coastal fruit, right? You know, when you head into that Russian river, you're not getting that effect of coral as much. And so I like having that, as you said, that Annapolis. I used to live um, right on the California coast. So I'm used to, uh, Carl and me got along very well. So what you are probably bundled in right now is what I was wearing in, in August when I lived on the California coast, because it is cold. So let's, uh, let's start jumping into the wines. You know, we are known for the Sonoma Coast wines. They've been the ones that have been out in the public. But again, we make 32 wines and each is made as its own individual wine, which I think people don't understand about La Crema, you know, the huge difference between Monterey and Sonoma's location. So let's continue digging into the Sonoma Coast and let's start with the Chardonnay, which is what people know us for, even though we started making Pinots first, jazz hands, Pinots first, Pinots first, there we go. <laughs> okay, so tell us a little bit about this uh, Sonoma Coast Chardonnay and why we love it so much. Sure, I, you know, often asked what our, uh, our flagship wine is and if I had to pick one wine, which one would I, I come back to? And, you know, I, I took a leaf out of Randy Allum's book on this one, uh, who's the, the winemaker at Kendall Jackson. And, and he was asked one day what his favorite wine is and he had it straight away, which was their VR Chardonnay. So I, I took that on board and I, I thought long and hard and, you know, why would I go for one of our single vineyard wines? Why would I go for, for something that we make, you know, 100 cases of? And, and the answer has to be Sonoma Coast Chardonnay because it is the wine that really put La Crema on the map. And to a large degree, really put this appellation and this area on the map for winemaking. So, you know, what, in terms of the wines that we make, uh, it's about 60%, two thirds, if you will, is Chardonnay, the other third being Pinot Noir and smaller amounts of uh, so Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris, but Sonoma Coast Chardonnay is our our flagship wine. It's it's the, the our largest production. It's most widely distributed. Uh, my family can get it in New Zealand these days, which I think is pretty remarkable. But uh, it's when that wine comes together every year, it's it, it's incredibly satisfying to say, yeah, we've we've nailed it. We've put the the wine that we really wanted to in the bottle. Um, and if you think about vineyard sites and, and you think about this appellation, um, we're pulling fruit from the coast, from the Russian River, from southern Sonoma, Los Carneros, you know, throughout the appellation. And it gives us a, a, a great deal of layers, a very broad color palette, if you will, uh, to put the wine together from. And as Marita was saying, each of these areas are very, very different in terms of their, their fruit expression uh, on the nose and on the palate. And, and so it's not necessarily a one recipe fits all. Uh, you know, we have to be very mindful of what one area gives us versus another. Um, but putting it together at the end is, is an awful lot of fun. Um, and just to touch very briefly on the, the Chardonnay winemaking, you know, the, we try to harvest in the early mornings uh, to deliver the fruit to the winery while it's cold. Um, sometimes the picks will start at 1 or 2 a.m. And uh, it's very gently pressed. Uh, that press cycle takes about three hours. And then it's, it's really hands-off winemaking. It's, uh, we settle it overnight, uh, you know, for about 20, 24 hours and send it to the barrel room. And for this wine here, uh, it's about 90% fermented in barrel. Um, and of that barrel uh, portion, 20% uh, of that is American oak and 80% of it being French oak. And these are the, the 59, 60 gallon barrels, uh, about 300 bottles in each barrel. There's two fermentations for Chardonnay. The first one that we talk about is, the, is perhaps the, the important one is the, uh, the primary. 
which is converting sugar to alcohol. And then once that fermentation is complete, we go through a secondary fermentation called the malolactic fermentation. And that's converting a hard acid called malic acid into a softer acid called lactic acid. And that's what's going on in the barrel cellars at the moment is that secondary ferment. And so for a wine like this, this is going to stay in the barrel for about seven to eight months. And every month we uh, get all the barrels down on the floor and we give them a stir. We're hand stirring, giving them a good mix. Uh, that doesn't sound terribly romantic, but the, the dead yeast basically sink to the bottom of the barrel. We call that the lees. And it's getting that stirring and that mixing of the lees back up into the wine that really helps us build texture. Texture is a very, very important part of the wines uh, that we make. Uh, and it's when we're blending, I'd say that it's 60 to 70% of our, our focus is on that textural element of the wine. And then we think about, you know, juiciness and tannins and so forth to, uh, to complete the blend. So yeah, yeah, this is a super important wine for us. Yeah, and we are definitely known for that La Crema texture. Now we did have a question, I kind of answered it, but I love your take, Craig. Uh, someone asked, how, ma how many barrels do you have full at one time? I said, it depends on the vintage, right? It depends on what we can harvest, sure. you know, but give us a, you know, if you'd like to answer it anyway, you'd like to, you could. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, for us at, at La Crema here, we're, we're talking in the thousands of, of Chardonnay barrels. Um, yeah, and it, and it does go up and down depending on the year. But the harvest that we just finished, we were probably 30% shorter of Chardonnay than what we estimated we'd bring in. And, you know, that's just a, a feature of farming. At the end of the day, we're farmers and, and it wasn't a big crop last year. But yeah, we have we have thousands of barrels that we're maintaining and, and putting together for this for this wine in particular. You know, and I, I love that, and I kind of want to pause and emphasize that again. We are farmers, you know, we are farmers first, you know, we are farming our own land. We're American farmers in a time where more Americans' farms have closed than during the Great Depression, and we're family owned. So that's a huge kind of testament to what we're doing at La Crema, what we're doing at Kendall Jackson is the ability to still be fa American family owned farms, right? Who happen to make wine, <laughs> which is awesome, I think, you know. Um, anyways, let's keep going with this. So let's talk about our Pinot because these are kind of our Burgundian, jazz hands, Burgundian uh, wines that we make, types of grapes that are found in Burgundy. So. If you're making shard, you're probably going to make something that's cool climate, and that's Pinot. And let's talk about why Pinot definitely needs a cool climate, Craig. Sure. Well, it's it's all about uh, building color, flavor, and aroma uh, in those berries. And you know, here we're we're really blessed with a, the ideal climate. Um, we'll get a little bit scientific here and, and talk about climate and how that influences the grapes, but we're often talking about this thing called diurnal variation. And, and that's a, a number, if you will, that we, you know, it's the, the temperature differential between your daytime maximum and your nighttime low temperature. Now in this part of California and because of the fog and because of the Pacific Ocean, you know, our, our days here in the summer, let's say the mid nineties is, is fairly common for us. Uh, occasionally we'll go over hundred, 110 degrees, but that's that's pretty rare. So we get those days in 90 to 95 degrees, but then the nights can go down to to the mid 40s, the you know, and or the low 50s, and that's a, a 40 to 50 degree temperature swing from our daytime peak to our nighttime low. And all that that does uh, is that it helps build color, it it helps build flavor in the grapes, and really importantly, it maintains natural acidity in the berries. And that's why when you go into some of the warmer areas, we stop growing Pinot Noir, for example. Um, and that's why we stick to these coastal regions uh, that are influenced by the Pacific Ocean. Um, so that's that's one of the, the reasons that a cool climate really works. You know, I, I think here too, if we think about uh, the long days that we have, and that light interception, because it doesn't necessarily need to be hot as long as you're getting really good light interception on the on the vine. Um, 
And, and climate is, is one thing, but soil choice is, is very important as well. And, and we're forever seeking out these soils that are free draining, uh, have relatively low natural vigor. Uh, it sounds a bit harsh, but we're really trying to get the vines to struggle a little bit in order to give us the fruit with the most character. Um, and, you know, we have a, a dedicated and, and hugely experienced farming team that know how Pinot Noir and Chardonnay grow uh, in this part of the world. And uh, they, they all say that they give us 100 point grapes and, uh, and we take it from there. So, uh, yeah, but, but Pinot Noir is, is notoriously fickle. Uh, it's thin skinned, um, so it doesn't take a lot of, of abuse either out in the vineyard or in the winery. So we tend to be a little bit hands off in terms of what we're doing once we get the fruit to the winery. Um, going back to the vineyards, it's really important that we, uh, we get sunlight on it but not too much sunlight. We're trying to prevent the berries from getting sunburnt, uh, which, you know, we're, we're looking for freshness of flavor uh, and, and aroma in the berries. Sunburn tends to, to stews the fruit on the vine effectively. So we're trying to avoid that. But yeah, it's a, it's a, fickle, uh, a fickle mistress, if you will, um, but one that's uh, it's a lot of fun to make. Yes, the princess of grapes. <laughs> not too hot, not too cold, does not like to travel far, right? So um, before we go into uh, even a little bit deeper of how the Sonoma County um, uh, Sonoma wines taste, the number one question that I always get when I travel, and I'm sure you travel and we're getting it today, is what's the taste profile, and you told us about Sonoma, between the Sonoma and Monterey. When people are out there being like, do I want the Sonoma? Do I want the Monterey? You know, I have my take on it but I love yours. And then of course I will add my two cents at the end. Yeah, no, I think we're all different and, and have our, our preferences for, for either wine. Um, you know, if I, I start with Sonoma Coast, I think that that is a classic representation of, of California or certainly Sonoma Coast Chardonnay. Uh, we tend to be pretty firmly rooted in that uh, citrus and green apple uh, fruit spectrum, certainly from some of the cooler areas in Southern Sonoma. Uh, Russian River brings a little bit more uh, stone fruit character, maybe green pear, um, those apple pear fruit notes, um, and, and lovely texture. And then when I compare that to Monterey, you know, I, I think that, you know, the Monterey Chardonnay, by comparison to the classic Sonoma Coast, is, is like a bit of a teenage upstart, and it's sort of a bit punchy, it's a bit feisty, you know, it tends to, in terms of the fruit, spectrum on the Monterey Chardonnay, for my mind, it tends to be a little bit more tropical uh, oriented. So, you know, always think about pineapple, grilled pineapple, green melon, um, you know, even some of the like guava and passion fruit notes we're going to see in Monterey. And some of that is, is due to uh, the, you know, just where the grapes are grown, because it's going to differ, different soil types, different aspect to the sun different winds running through the valley, different, uh, you know, different minerals in the soil. Um, but in, in terms of the Monterey Chardonnay, one of the key differences comes from the clonal mix um, of, of Chardonnay down there. So Chardonnay, like grapes, you know, there's Chardonnay, but there's like 10 different types of Chardonnay. And I, I think it's like, you know, we have apples, but we've got Red Delicious, we've got Granny Smith and so forth. And they each have different colors, different flavors, and different cluster morphology. So in Monterey, we tend to have a higher percentage of those vines that give us more of those tropical fruit notes than we see on the North Coast. So I hope that explains that and that I didn't, uh, didn't confuse them out of there. No, 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 no. I love it. I love talking about morphology. One of the ways that I like to just simplify it, because people are like, when should I drink it? <laughs> or which one should I have? I, I truly believe that Monterey is more of a food wine with the, the diversity that it has. You know, it can stand up to food. Um, also, there's elements of salinity. You can really taste that sea salt on those skins that have a tendency because they're so windy. And we're talking about hurricane level one winds almost every day that pick up between the hours of 12 and seven. That is said to drive people mad, but they have excellent posture. But that being said, 
those wines I truly believe are those food wines because you have your sugar, your salt, and your acid. Those Sonoma Coast wines are great cocktail wines, which you can enjoy alone, you know, not just drinking alone. I mean, without food, but you can kind of have more flexibility with those. So I always tell people, you know, start off, you know, your, your, your cooking wine is your, you know, your uh, Sonoma, you know, Sauvignon Blanc, maybe, you know, while you're cooking and drinking, when your friends come in, serve them the Sonoma and then get into your Monterey series again or into your Russian River. So I just wanted to add that. So awesome. So let us, let's go into, you gave us the difference. Thank you so much. It helps people decide, you know, what their taste profile is. And one thing that I've noticed is that uh, beer drinkers, um, who are not huge wine people love the Monterey wines versus the Som Sonoma because of the textural element. They're used to hoppiness or they're used to a certain thing. So if you're a beer drinker looking to try an excellent uh, handmade wine uh, that's 100%, right, Pinot Noir or Chardonnay, check out the Monterey series. It'll be a nice introduction into wine and then you'll never, you'll never go back, you know? You'll just keep going with La Crema, <laughs> which is what we like. But let's dig into this Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir and just kind of the taste uh, profile of it because it is a beautiful wine, like year in and year out. Wow, Th thank you so much, Craig. But why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, again, I'll, I'll lead and say that it's, for me, it's a classic representation. And um, again, we're pulling fruit from a fairly large geographical area from the most southern point to the most northerly point, it's, it's about 80, 80, 85 miles. So there's a number of different climates, uh, soils, aspects and so forth there. And again, it gives us that broad uh, color palette to, uh, to put the wine together from. But in terms of the, the fruit profile on Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir, you know, whenever I smell that, I'm you know, immediately thinking about cherries and plums and the spice from the oak and there's a little sort of earthy herbaceous character there from some of the, maybe some of the cooler sites that we're picking fruit from. Um, but there's, when you put it in the mouth, there's richness, there's layers of flavour, uh, there's, there's firm but integrated tannins. And the key again on all of these wines is that that acid backbone that comes from those cool climates that we're growing in. So it's, uh, you know, I often say it, it, it's very approachable when it's young, it's multi-layered, but it's got enough structure and concentration of fruit that it's going to stand up to a fairly diverse range of foods. So it's, uh, you know, you can drink it at 10 a.m., 11 a.m., or you can drink it at, at 8 or 9 p.m. with your dinner as well. It's, it's pretty versatile sort of a wine. Yes, and if you come from the uh, Janice Robinsons who tastes wine before she has coffee, go ahead and drink some La Crema Sonoma <laughs> if you're wine tasting. <laughs> Keep your palate clean. <laughs> Why not? Um, one of the things that we keep saying, and I love this, is classic. You know, I also like to talk about t the timelessness of La Crema because people, one of the reason people love La Crema is because it delivers. They know what they're getting into, right? Um, and one of the things is that we're not just considered classic because we say we're classic. We're actually considered classic by a lot of people in California and the Court of Master Sommeliers. So we are considered that benchmark wine, which they use in their tasting uh, and testing up to sometimes, you know, advanced. And definitely when people think of like, if I'm going to, if I'm studying, you know, if I want a really classic, you know, Pinot Noir from the Sonoma Coast, they go to La Crema because we've been doing this for so long. And one thing that you forgot to, to mention uh, uh, that I love back in when we started 1979, no one was making Pinot at that time. Everyone was making Cab. And those people that were trying to make Pinot were trying to make it like Cab. So it tasted like burning car tire. So La Crema was the first <laughs> winemakers making Pinot Noir in Sonoma that made it not taste like burning car tire. So kudos to La Crema always being the best of the vine and bringing the best forward. So we're also known for a lot of amazing innovation. So, you know, that's why I think people depend on us. So since people depend on us and um, we love to always be able to have passion projects, right? So we have passion projects when we went up to Oregon, we have passion projects with our Pinot Gris, we have passion projects with our 
um, our bubbles are beautiful sparkling. And the latest passion project that La Crema has is Sauvignon Blanc. And so why don't we talk a little bit about that Sauvignon Blanc. You do come from New Zealand. Uh, and here, the way that I usually talk about this is this is like your love letter to Sonoma, right? <laughs> And I should uh, preface all of this by, by saying that over the years, as I've been uh, pouring La Crema wines around the country, that I've had so many people tell me that they absolutely love our Sauvignon Blanc. And I'm like, really? Like, you know, we weren't making one until uh, last year. And if I had a dollar for everybody that told me they loved our Sauvignon Blanc, I'd, I'd be doing all right. So maybe they just knew more than I did at that time. But uh yeah, we were really excited to uh, to you know start making Sauvignon Blanc because you know we're always looking for the next new vineyard, the next new appellation that we can make wine from, and 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 you know make the next wine. And seeing that uh, Sauvignon Blanc was really that a really you know, it was a pretty easy choice at the end of the day. So we set about looking at some of the the vineyards that we have uh, within Jackson Family Wines um, and we looked at some outside growers as well and uh, and set about making uh, this 2019 Sonoma County Sauvignon Blanc and and yeah I I uh, having had been in in California now for about 13 years I really had shelved just about everything that I used to know about making Sauvignon Blanc so I had to go back to uh, to reading textbooks and reading through some of my old notes and so forth to see what <laughs> we and and I, I I will say also that you know that Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, which New Zealand is is most well known for, is its own thing. You know, there's no way we can do that style of Sauvignon Blanc in in California, for my mind. You know, they're two very very different growing regions, uh, and and I I think the expectation for the wines that have gotten to come out of the other end are very different as well. Having said that, it's still very important for us to, to make a Sauvignon Blanc that is distinctively Sauvignon Blanc. So here, you know, we're not going to see those grassy uh, green bell pepper, even cat pea notes that you see from, uh, from Marlborough. Um, but we do see a lot of, uh, a lot of tropical fruit, citrus fruit, those stone fruit notes. Uh, on the nose and in the mouth as well. Now this one here, uh, it does have a little bit of barrel uh, influence here. Um, it's about 40% uh, fermented in, in neutral oak, um, but the rest is in stainless steel. Um, that oak fermentation or that barrel fermentation just really helps us with the textural element of the wine. Um, yeah, we had to make a Sauvignon Blanc, but we also had to make a wine that uh, that people recognised as being a La Crema wine. And we go back to that textural component again. So we wanted to make a wine that was very fresh, very vibrant and juicy, but had a, had a good mouthfeel and, and great texture to it. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the vineyard sourcing there, um, there's some fantastic Sauvignon Blanc country in this part of California. And, you know, for us, it was a it was a new exploration into this area called Knights Valley, which is uh, between Sonoma and Napa. Uh, it tends to be a little bit cooler out there, so perfect for Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, we looked at the Alexander Valley um, and the Dry Creek Valley, and uh, and that really makes up the the, the fruit sourcing for this wine. Um, Sauvignon Blanc is uh, it's usually one of the first wines that we we finish every year and goes into the bottle. Um, and actually we're just finishing off the, the 2020 version at the moment. So, uh, yeah, it's, a, it, it's nice to, to be sort of become reacquainted with Sauvignon Blanc and, uh, and hopefully you'll have had a chance to taste it or are tasting it and, um, and, and enjoy it. I, when I got the sample, when we were all, you know, with, uh, COVID and everyone, everyone got samples and we tasted with the winemaking team and you led us through it. By the time we got to the Sauvignon Blanc, my bottle was gone. So it is easy drinking. And I'm not someone who drinks bottles of wine anymore, maybe in my young days, but that one, whoo, that was, that was ready to go down. But let's uh, jump into, um, I, we, let's do one more question here. I answered a little bit, but I love your take on it. You know, our wines are made so well. You know, they're 
natural ingredients. We're not adding dyes or colorings or anything like that. And that's something that I always like to note is that wines are not uh, ruled by the FDA. So you're not gonna look at an ingredient list, but you can gar be guaranteed that you're getting natural stuff at La Crema. So what's the ageability of our wines? Um, I did talk a little bit about how our single vineyards and our Appalachian series age longer. We have a longer potential for aging than our Sonoma and Monterey, and that we use different corks because of that. But why don't you talk about, because I think everyone's drinking Sonoma and Monterey, what's the, what's, what, what's the time that we're looking at, you know, drinking these wines, even though the American consumer, I think, drinks wines within 30 minutes of purchase, uh, if they do hold on to a Sonoma, how long could they hold on to it? Yeah, I, I, there's no real rule of thumb here. And it, I think it comes back to your own preference for how you like to drink your wines. So personally, I prefer my wines to be nice and fresh to still have that, that nice fruity component. Um, I tend not to enjoy them when the fruit starts going away and the fruit dries out and, and you know, they, they just turn the corner. But yeah, if you like your wines with a bit of age, then then that's fine. But I think with the Sonoma Coast and Monterey, I'm always sort of saying that that four years, maybe five years, absolute max on, on those wines before you will see a noticeable decline in that freshness and the vibrancy of the wine. So, you know, we're, we're playing in this the sandbox, if you will, where we want the wines to to be drinkable upon release but we want them to have some longevity. And I think that four to five years is, is a decent, uh, decent time. Yeah, I think that's great. And just to give you an idea of the Russian River series or Carneros Appalachian series, I had one a, couple, like a year ago um, and it was about 10, 11 years old, California Chardonnay out of Carneros um, and it was pristine. So there you go. So let's talk about, um, first of all, is everyone still having fun? Yes, yes, yes. Should we do a quiz question now, Shannon, or should we keep going? Sure, let's yeah, do a quiz. Totally. Let's do a quick quiz. Let's make sure we're, we've been paying attention to the jazz hands. So <laughs> let's see if you can tell us what the original name of La Crema was. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, so here we go. I'm, I'm helping do this. Everyone's, everyone's, everyone is doing. So the first one that, uh, okay. Michael French got it correct, spelled it correct and gave us the translation of what it means. So Michael French, congratulations. Well, well done. Played, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. If you wanna just enter your email address um, in the chat, either to myself or Marita, we can get you um, your prize pack. Awesome. So let's uh, dive into uh, the pizza and then, then, we'll, then we'll do a few other questions. So pizza and wine. So this is a program that we launched this year that you're saying, well, don't we always drink pizza? In a, I mean, drink wine and have pizza. We do, but we wanted to do a pairing. You know, people love La Crema, people love pizza. It is the most, um, eaten a uh, uh, meal in the United States at these times. I mean, I like me, my pie. And uh, so we were able to pair up and and have you jump in with us. Unfortunately, Craig does not have pizza in front of him, nor do I, but that's okay. We will dream with you, a beautiful dream. And let's go into the, the Cinema Chardonnay that it's paired with caramelized onion, chicken, and bacon. Now you pick these pairings, Craig. So tell us a little bit about why that Cinema uh, Chardonnay is going to go so well with things that can be considered heavy, you know, chicken, bacon, you know, caramelized, you know, onions. Well, they, they had me a bacon, to be perfectly honest. So uh, <laughs> that was an easy choice. But uh, no, I, I think it, you know, Chardonnay and, and chicken is, is a classic pairing. And, you know, to, to talk about the rules of food pairing again, I, I, you know, it's whatever you like. You know, I think if we go back 20 years, it was white wine with white meats, or white proteins and, and red wines with the, the red meats. And I, yeah, maybe that still stands today, but, you know, whatever works for you is, is absolutely fine. So, so yeah, 
putting the bacon aside here, I uh, I just looked at the the Chardonnay and chicken and thought, what a what a classic pairing that is. And there's, you know, looking at the the menu, there's some really nice sweet and savory uh, elements um, with the uh, the caramelized onion, the maple soy. And I, I just think that the, the Sonoma Co Chardonnay has enough layers of flavor and, you know, not to be overwhelmed uh, by, by richer foods. Um, but having that, that pretty vibrant acidity in the wine is, is really helpful to, to cut through some of the richness of, uh, of say, the cheeses and, and, and the proteins as well. So I, I think it's, you know, there's, there's enough there to, uh, to, to really help elevate the, the, the wine. You know, because it's not a it's not a one way street where the wine makes the food better. The food makes the wine really pop as well. So, and we were sort of thinking about that interplay. What what will what will pop? Say the the fruit character of the wine. Where will the acids cut through? And you know, is there a a savory element to the wine that that balances that savory element in the food? So I. Yeah, you know, I'm pretty simple, but uh, had me at bacon, but there was enough going on here that, uh, that, that you know, I thought it would be a lovely pairing. Beautiful. And you keep mentioning the, the amazing acidity that these wines have, and it's really important to note, right? It's that mouth puckering sensation that you get. If you drink a wine and your mouth is watering, that means it has natural acid, right? And that acid can come either um, from the fruit, right? If you were like, you know, biting into a lemon, that's mouth-watering acid. And so we like that because it keeps our palates clean, right? If this wine was too much more, you know, more buttery as everyone calls Chardonnay, it would actually shut down your palate. So then it would send a message to your brain that you're done. You've had enough. Sometimes we listen to it. Sometimes we don't. But by keeping a clean palate, keeping that mouth watering sensation happening that you keep eating and drinking and who doesn't like to keep eating and drinking when it comes to pizza and having some cinema kosher name. So that's, I just wanted to throw that in um, into the mix so people understand what we're getting into. So beautiful, yes, it's so delicious. I love that. And, you know, what I really liked about your pairing with uh, being a vegetarian myself, and for those who do not eat bacon, I love that you, we went vegetarian with uh, the Sauvignon Blanc. And, you know, you paired it with that broccolini and that is pure magic. So tell us about that pairing. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I... I love broccolini and it's one of the, the few vegetables I can get my kids to eat as well. So we, uh, we eat a lot of it at home. Um, but whenever I, I eat broccolini, I always think about the snap and, and you know, that, that freshness that, that broccolini has. Um, that there coupled with the, again, the, the sweetness, uh, the acid sweetness of the, the balsamic onion, the tomato jam, you know, that's a, a perfect balance there if you, or balancing uh, feature with that, that juiciness and, and perhaps more sort of uh, snappy um, tropical flavors on the Sauvignon Blanc. But yeah, the, the broccolini there was the, the key for me. I, you know, I just think it, the, the snap there was what I thought about straight away. And I think that the snap of that and the snap of the wine is, is a perfect pairing. And I love that because we're talking now textures, right? How to build a texture when you're creating wine, how textures interact. So if you are a texture person, you know, when you're out there and you see something soft and you just want to pet it, you know, you are a texture person. <laughs> and so I love that we're talking about that. And then we're not just talking about flavors, but how to build texture to keep things interesting, right? I've had a few boring dinners myself the last couple of days, but now I'm excited to eat again after having this conversation. So thank you. <laughs> and uh, let's, uh, let's throw on another quick question in here before we, we go into that Pinot Noir. And so let's this, here's another quiz question, people. I did do a jazz hand. Um, our good friend Craig talked a lot about the cool climate in Sonoma Coast. And so I did a little jazz hand and said, what was the name of that weather system that is that cool climate? There we go. Daria, Carl the Fog with a K. Yes, there you go, Daria. Thank you so much. Carl, a German name, even though it's the Russian River. So thank you so much. Awesome. So we'll keep this going now that someone else has an amazing prize. 
and we have about 15 minutes left. Let's dig into that mouth-watering, ah, oh, Pinot Noir mushrooms. I mean, any day, yes, please. So let's talk about, and then you add that to, to Leggio. Oh, I'm dreaming, I'm having dreams right now. So let's talk about the Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir. Why does Pinot Noir pair so well with mushrooms, Craig? You know, I, I, I think it's a, a, a number of factors there. It's that, that, that on two hands is the delicacy of the fruit, but also the, the power that the fruit has in Pinot Noir. But I, I think it's perhaps it comes back to those earthy or savory elements that, that Pinot Noir is known for that makes it a perfect pairing with mushroom. And, you know, Pinot across the board, I, I think is, and I'm, I'm biased admittedly because that's what I make, but I, I, I think that Pinot Noir is, is perhaps one of the most uh, versatile uh, wines and, and, you know, for food pairings. Some of that I think comes from the range of wines that Pinot Noir is made into from the sparkling wines to uh, rosés and now with the table wines that we're talking about here. You know, think about that spectrum of food that Pinot Noir pairs with. But in, in this case here, you know, mushroom and Pinot Noir is, is, is classic. You know, I was, uh, you know, if there was duck on the, the pizza, I would have been pretty keen for that. I, th I think the, 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 there was a beef pizza um, that, that would have been perfect as well. But I, I just think classic wine with a classic pairing that, uh, that the mushroom and, and Pinot thing, you couldn't go wrong. But I you know, also think about the, the Taleggio and, and the richness that that brings and the tanginess that that brings. And again, how that's just a wonderful pairing with the layers of flavor and that juicy acidity that you're gonna see in Pinot Noir. Beautiful, I, I wonder if there's a little rosemary on this pizza as well, that'd be lovely. I'm just saying. Yeah, and I, I, I just saw too, a little bit of arugula. Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, just that little bit of spicy peppery note from the arugula, I think will, uh, will Will balance pretty well. Do you also call it rocket in New Zealand or is it just in Australia? Yeah, it's, it's, it's called rocket there as well. I love it. I, lo I, won, I, I had an Australian friend in the moment that I heard that they called it rocket. I was like, that's what I'm calling it. I mean, awesome. yeah. it's amazing. You're eating a rocket. I mean, I'm yeah. totally in for that. So <laughs> <laughs> ah, I love that. And it can be so, um, can be sharp, arugula can be so spicy and sharp. And so I love that how that can add to the spiciness of our Pinot Noir. So let's see if there's any questions so far. Is everyone enjoying their pizza and their wine? Anyone have like a perfect like mouth and you know pairing that they wanna talk about that they would prefer over the other ones? Let's see if anyone has anything to say. Yeah, I'd, I'd be really interested to uh, to find out how those pairings went. Um, obviously, you don't have the the uh, the pizzas in front of me, but um, hopefully, they went all right. Okay, it says making me hungry for a good pizza. We're still waiting. We'll see. Lisa, would you like to tell us a little bit about the availability of these wines? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have some really great pricing on the La Crema wines that we've um, that Craig has walked us through tonight. Um, so this month we have the Sonoma Chardonnay, uh, which is priced at $14.97. Uh, we have the Sonoma Pinot Noir, which is uh, priced at $17.57, and the Sauvignon Blanc, which is um, $14.99. Um, and like you said, um, we current we started selling the Sauvignon Blanc over the, um, in 2020, and it's currently part of one of our power our power by program, um, and this is a really great program, very popular. Um, it's uh, it's uh, we have hundreds of wines that are in there, but it's uh, great pricing and quality made wines. Um, so you can pretty much stop in any um, New Hampshire liquor store and find all three of these wines, plus um, the Monterey series uh, wines as well, um, which we also offer some great pricing on those um, for December as well. Beautiful, thank you so much. Now here's some of the pairing. They're saying pairing excellent mushroom and arugula with Pinot Noir. Some people are enjoying pepperoni and onion pizza and the Sonoma Pinot Noir. Some people are doing a Detroit, oh, oh, someone is, get, is throwing down. They're doing Detroit style margarita pizza. Now, 
you are you are getting into the pizza because if people know what Detroit style means, you know it's it's a thicker crust, right? Um, when I did this, uh, when I when I first created this, I did um, about two three months of uh, intense pizza study. It was not good for my waistline, but um, I had to investigate. And so many people are like, because New Hampshire, you have your own style of pizza, correct? Yes, which is very different from New York, which is very different from Detroit, which is very different from a flatbread. So um, I love it that people get into, you know, Detroit style. Pinot caramelized onion fig, fig. Someone's doing it with a fruity balsamic pizza. Oh, beauty, beautiful. These are delicious, delicious. What, Craig, what do you think of all those pairings? Any favorites there? Uh, I mean, they all look pretty solid to me, Marita. I'd, I uh, I could have paired every pizza on 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 the menu with uh, with every wine. Um, and what folks are throwing up throwing up here in the chat is uh, it looks pretty appealing as well. It's making me hungry. Beautiful. Let's turn it over. See if anyone else has some questions. I'll go see. I'll go through the chat. I think we've answered about all of the questions so far. Before we throw in the last last quiz question. Marita, this is actually a great time too for me to talk about the 90 days around the world promotion while you kind of search for a few more questions yeah. if you'd like. Um, so for those of you that are joining us for the first time, um, this event tonight is part of our 90 days around the world promotion. And so we're offering all of our viewers the chance to win some really great prizes. The grand prize actually offers someone the chance to build their own at-home bar with a $2,500 gift card to the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets as well as some one-on-one -on -one guidance from our team of experts, just to be sure that you pick all the right products to stock your bar with. Um, so entering for a chance to win is super simple. You just need to head to your app store on your Android or Apple device and download the Scavify app. That's spelled S-C-A-V-I-F-Y. And essentially you're gonna earn points for every single event that you join with us uh, by entering a special code word that we will provide to you during each event. Uh, so for those of you that are already playing, tonight's code word is 40 years. Again, tonight's code word is 40 years. And so for all of the points that you earn or the more points you earn, the bigger the prizes that you're going to be entered to win. Um, so we've got countless gift cards um, of varying different values. Uh, definitely want to check that out. You can find all of the details on the 90daysaroundtheworld.com website as well. And it kind of gives you a breakdown of how you can play and join for your enter or for your chance to win. Beautiful, how exciting, 40, okay. We do have one question, a new question, and I'm guessing this is for Craig. Um, how did you get into this career? What made you want to do it? And how do you simply start? So how did you fall in love with uh, winemaking, Craig? <laughs> you know, uh... A lot of you have probably worked out that my name is quite Scottish. Um, and so with a name like that, alcohol was probably going to feature some way or another. Um, but uh, no, I, I, this is really like a, a third go at a career for me. And I, I was originally trained in, uh, in the food and beverage world in hotels in New Zealand. And that's really where I, I got exposed to, uh, to good wine. You know, that was very different from the, the stuff that my folks were drinking at home. And um, that sort of piqued an interest there uh, for me, but then I, uh, I left that behind me and I, I traveled and lived in the UK uh, for about six years and sort of a little bit more of the European wines, obviously there. Um, and then when I went back to New Zealand, I, you know, I didn't want to go back into the, the food and beverage game. Um, and so I, I sort of muddled around for a few years, spent a bit of time at the beach and, uh, and then decided that it was time to get serious. So went to university and I, you know, I was wondering what should I do? And, and you know, I just serendipity, I opened the paper and um, my local university was having an open day and I saw that they offered a viticulture and enology program. And I thought, well, that sounds awesome. You know, I, I, I love drinking wine. I'm, I was very passionate about about that side of it, um, but really was quite interested in how it was made. And, you know, I'd worked in construction for a while when I was in the UK. And, you know, I think that sort of brought out a bit of a, a creative bent in me as well. And I, you know, love to travel, love being outdoors, love being you know, indoors when the weather's foul. And I, I just thought that this is, 
a pretty exciting sort of a career. And so I went off to university and, and did that. And, uh, and really that was just a foot in the door. That was just a, a piece of paper to say that I'm pretty interested in this, uh, this business. And, you know, then I started traveling and, and working in wineries around the world. So that, you know, took me to Australia first and foremost, um, then spent three or four years in New Zealand uh, in wineries and, uh, and then came to California. But then I went away again to Cyprus and the Mediterranean and, and uh, down to Chile for harvests as well. So, yeah, you know, with that appeal of the, of the travel and, and the fact that wineries and, and Appalachians tend to be in beautiful places, it was, it was a pretty easy choice. And, you know, how do you get started in it today? Um, you know, I think uh, it's easy for me to say that being based in wine country, but, you know, every, uh, every June, July and August, we're furiously uh, looking to bring people on board to work harvests and, for some people, it's, you know, working a harvest in the cellar that really gets that, that bug going in them. So, you know, it, it, for me, it was pretty easy. I won't say that it, that it would be that way for everybody, but, you know, get involved in it uh, where you can for a start, be it serving wine, um, selling wine or, or coming to work in the wineries. And, you know, one thing always leads to another and, you know, there's always a, a door opening somewhere. Um, to move into. So come and see us in June or July if you're really keen. We'd love to hear from you. Bring, uh, bring clothes that you can burn afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, we shouldn't good. joke about fires, but... Uh... We shouldn't. Actually, we shouldn't. I'm sorry. I shouldn't. You know, it's so fun. Um, yes, no, we will not set fire to anything. Um, so one last question. Everyone's like, ah, I want to win the last thing. So the, uh, Craig has been talking a lot about two very important things that we are known for in our wines. The first would be texture and then the other mouth sensation. What would that be? Boom, Catherine Bashaw, acid. There you go. Catherine, thank you so much. And that's it, that wraps us up. My name is Marita, the galactic brand ambassador for La Crema. We are, I'm here with Craig McAllister, the amazing head winemaker at La Crema. So excited to be part of this amazing drink around the world, this ability to sit and not have to go through TSA <laughs> and still enjoy wine. <laughs> And if, uh, if, if we're all able to get to the, uh, to the grand tasting uh, next January and come and see us at the La Crema table, it'd be lovely to, uh, to, to see you. And once we get off this hamster wheel, when we can all travel again, come and see us in California. You know, we've got a, a lovely uh, estate just around the corner here from the winery, um, just a beautiful spot, overlooks one of our key vineyards and uh, four levels of, of tasting pleasure right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Craig, I'm going to hold you to uh, coming to next year to Winter Wine Spectacular and Wine Week because we really want you back. It was a pleasure to have you for a couple of years and uh, we really want to see you back here. It was a uh, pleasure to be mine. <laughs> well, I want to thank Craig McAllister of La Crema Wines and Marita Estela of Galactic Wines for joining us tonight. This was an amazing presentation. I'm super happy you were both able to join us. Um, just been so awesome. I've learned so much. Um, I've just been loving this, this whole program that we've been doing. So fingers crossed, 2022, we are able to hold Winter Wine Spectacular. We can get you here in person. Oh, yeah, right. For those of you that are still watching, if you enjoyed tonight's event, please be sure to pre-register on our 90daysaroundtheworld.com website for future events so that you can be entered to win exclusive prizes from our uh, guests. So again, tonight's was some La Crema uh, prize packs, which was super Great. exciting. Um, again, the code word for your 90 days password tonight, passport, excuse me, is 40 years. So we've got a handful of really great wine events for you in the coming weeks. So be sure you check out the 90 days around the world.com site to find out which events you'd like to attend and pre-register for them. So if you have any further questions for Craig and Marita, please don't hesitate to reach out on Facebook and we will do our best to get them all answered for you. 
Have a great night, everyone. We hope to see you all again uh, next week for some more great events. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.